Hello, good evening everyone. I'm very happy to be here in Milan for the first time. Normally when I go to work in Israel wearing this suit in the hot Mediterranean sun, I'm by far the most overdressed person uh, on the street. And today I landed in a city where everyone is on their vintage Vespers in designer suits and I feel underdressed. <laughs> Tomorrow marks eight months since the beginning of the October 7th war, eight months since the darkest day in Israel's history, eight months since the darkest day in Jewish history, since the chimneys of Europe were still churning. Eight months in which the world has had time to reflect on what is truly at stake in this war. What is truly at stake in Israel's longest war since the War of Independence, a war that many Israelis are calling their second war of independence. At stake, is it only the lives of the hostages still trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons? 125 people, over 40 of whom have been killed, who are being starved and tortured and raped and executed by the brutal terror organization that burned whole families alive on October 7th. At stake in this war, is it the right of Israeli families to sleep in their beds, of young Israelis to go to a music festival, to go for a bike ride, for a jog in the morning, and know that they will not be abducted by terrorists in terrorist-controlled territory just over the border and taken into a dark tunnel somewhere? At stake, is it the peace, prosperity, security, and existence of the state of Israel? Because this is not a local war between Israel and a Palestinian terrorist group in Gaza. This is a regional war in which Israel is fighting for its life against Iran and its proxy armies on seven different fronts. Every moment, Israel is on high alert against the terrorists in Gaza who still hold hostages and are firing rockets at Israeli cities, against terrorists in the West Bank who continue to try to perpetrate attacks against Israelis, against Hezbollah in Lebanon, which has 150,000 missiles pointed at us, shooting them every single day, displacing 60,000 Israelis from their homes for eight months. They are refugees in their own countries, in their own country, because a terrorist army with the eighth largest missile stockpile in the world is shooting rockets at their homes and suicide drones to deliberately target civilians. And then the first responders who come to save them. That's three fronts. We also have attacks coming from Syria, from the Iranian militia in Iraq, from the Houthi pirates in Yemen, and from Iran itself. Just this week, we had a drone attack from Iraq that Israel had to shoot down. Iran's proxy army in Yemen fired a ballistic missile at Eilat that we had to intercept in space. Hezbollah set northern Israel on fire. Seven fronts, Iran and its proxy armies. At stake, perhaps, is it the peace and prosperity of the Jewish diaspora around the world? Because this is not a war on seven fronts, it is a war on eight fronts where Jews around the world are being intimidated and harassed and threatened. Yes, here too in Europe. Yes, here too in Italy. There's a good reason that the evil supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, called the protesters on campuses a branch of the resistance front. He is saying they are the same as Hamas and Hezbollah. Because when they chant from the river to the sea, they don't mean they want one single, peaceful, secular democracy for all. 
They mean the violent destruction of the state of Israel. They know it and he knows it. When they chant globalize the intifada, they don't mean let's all resist in a nice peaceful way. They mean targeted violence against Jews and Israelis and exporting terrorism across Europe and the West. And Israel has already helped Western governments prevent and foil terror attacks on their own soil. But I think that there is something so much greater at stake in this war, greater than the fate of Israel, greater than the fate of the Jews, greater than the fate of Europe. It's this question. Does truth matter anymore? Do facts matter anymore? Does the law matter anymore? Because Hamas is not only waging a physical war against Israel, together with Iran and its proxy armies. It is waging an information war. A war of deliberate misinformation. A psyops campaign against Israel that is designed to poison global public opinion against the only liberal democracy in the Middle East that is determined to delegitimize the Jewish state, make it a global pariah by spreading lie after lie after lie. And unfortunately, there is no lie so ridiculous that people will not believe it about Israel. There is a campaign underfoot now to paint the state of Israel, the Jewish and democratic state of Israel, as the new Nazi Germany. That is the meaning of the despicable campaign by South Africa, joined today by your neighbors in Spain, to accuse Israel of genocide. It is to say that the state of Israel, created as a safe haven for the Jews who survived the Holocaust, built by the Jews who were fortunate enough to get out of Europe before the Holocaust, which exists to ensure that a Holocaust can never happen again, is guilty of the same crimes as the Nazis. And that is a campaign that is supposed to make you, people in Europe, think that if the Jews are as bad as the Nazis, maybe the Nazis should have finished the job back in 1945. And if they didn't, and the Jews are as bad as the Nazis now, maybe we should. That is what is at stake with the despicable campaign by South Africa acting as the legal arm of Hamas to accuse Israel of genocide. A campaign to take a crime defined in the wake of the crimes that shock the, history, the conscience of mankind and to empty it of meaning. Because on October 7th, the people of Israel were the victims of an act of genocide. Hamas sent in its death squads with a view to murdering as many people as it could, as brutally as it could, and it would have killed many more than the 1,200 people it slaughtered in a single day if our men and women had not stopped them. It was a massacre committed with Nazi-like cruelty, Nazi-like efficiency, in the service of a Nazi-like ideology that seeks the destruction and murder of every Jew in the land of Israel and indeed around the world. South Africa is intervening as the legal arm of Hamas to try to save it from the consequences of the war that it started, a war that Israel did not want, did not start, did not expect, but is having to fight to bring back the hostages and make sure that never again means never again. South Africa is trying to save Hamas from the consequences of that campaign by turning Israel into a global pariah. Because when you paint it as Nazi Germany, all means are kosher. You do not negotiate with Nazis. You do not talk to them. You do not accommodate them. You eliminate them. And that is what Hamas, Iran, and its supporters around the world are trying to hoodwink the free world into doing to Israel. This is a war in which truth has been stripped of meaning. Hillel mentioned earlier the example from early October when an Islamic Jihad rocket shrapnel hit the car park of a hospital and killed a few dozen people. But Hamas sent out a press release 
saying that it was an Israeli airstrike on the hospital that flattened the building and killed 500 people. By the way, when you see Hamas's casualty counts, the numbers of people it claims have been killed in this war, they include the 500 people who did not die at that hospital. This is a war in which facts have no meaning and at which the institutions we rely on as the free world, the institutions we rely on as the international community to be neutral arbiters, to uphold the international rules-based order, have been weaponized in the service of a violent ideology. In which when, as Hillel says, the World Health Organization cannot bring itself to condemn Hamas for waging war out of hospitals, and blames Israel for going after Hamas in the hospitals, it seeks to redefine international law as saying that terrorists have immunity from attack if they hide in the basement of a hospital. And terrorists around the world are taking notes. In which UN officials tell Israel that it cannot attack Hamas targets in Hamas strongholds because civilians might get hurt. And then when Israel says that it will encourage civilians to get out of the way and buy tents at the expense of the Israeli taxpayer and create a humanitarian zone so that civilians can get out of Hamas strongholds and be protected, the same UN officials say, no, you cannot attack Hamas targets because then civilians will be displaced. They tell Israel it must protect civilians and then they try to make it an, international, an internationally illegal move to protect them. Swooping in to save Hamas by saying if you hide behind enough civilians, you have immunity. And there is nothing that the professional army of a democratic state can do if you weaponize and exploit international law in that way. So many allegations can treat completely emptying words of meaning. The repulsive allegation of apartheid against Israel, a state in which 20% of its citizens are Arabs, full citizens of the country. They serve in its courts, its Supreme Court, its parliament, in its media. They are our doctors and nurses. I'll tell you a remarkable story. Just last week, I got in a taxi, an Arab Muslim taxi driver from East Jerusalem, who told me with pride that he saved two girls from the Nova Festival. And that at 6.40 in the morning, he bundled them into the taxi, drove them away, his hands shaking on the wheel as he saw the paragliders coming in. And he tells me with pride, if Allah takes me tomorrow, I will die proud that I saved two girls from the Nova Party. That is Israel. Allegations from UN officials that have picked a side and make no doubt about it. Dr. Tedros at the World Health Organization, Francesca, I'm sorry, she's one of yours, have picked a side and they want Hamas to win. The allegations that Gaza is on the brink of famine. They predicted there would be tens of thousands of people dying of starvation by now. The UN has not updated its numbers in a month. Why? Because Israel is facilitating unrestricted amounts of aid into the Gaza Strip. The number of aid trucks have gone up Month by month, there is now far more food entering Gaza every day than there was before the war. And according to a recent academic study, enough food that it's 60% more than a woman's recommended daily allowance in calories. Food, Israel is flooding Gaza with aid and the UN is drowning under it. Just yesterday, Israel released images of the contents of 1,000 trucks worth of humanitarian aid sitting inside the Gaza Strip waiting for the UN to collect it. And instead of scaling up its operations and delivering that humanitarian aid, the responsible officials continue to repeat the lie that Israel is blocking aid from entering the Gaza Strip. Even as Egypt refused to let trucks leave El Arish and reach the Israeli crossing at Kerem Shalom. Even as Hamas continued to shoot rockets and mortars 
at the Israeli crossings. For Israeli soldiers, even as Israel worked to facilitate aid into Gaza by air, land, and sea, the same UN continued to accuse Israel of choking off aid to Gaza because facts don't matter. What does it mean for you, for Europe, when the United Nations is covering up how Hamas has embedded itself in UN facilities? The attack overnight on a Hamas compound in a school in Gaza was the fifth Israeli airstrike on a Hamas compound in a UN facility just this month. Now, the head of UNRWA, Mr. Lazzarini, is he also an Italian? Swiss, Swiss okay. I'll let you off for that one. <laughs> Said these claims are shocking and we cannot verify them. He should not be shocked because that is Hamas's modus operandi to embed itself in civilian structures, in UN buildings, in UNRWA buildings, because it knows it will get away with it. Hamas built its, its intelligence headquarters in a tunnel 20 meters under UNRWA's main offices in Gaza that leached electricity from the offices above ground. And the UN claims with a straight face Maybe we left the television on on the weekend, and that's why the electricity bill was so high. You are suffering from this. Emptying words of meaning, twisting international law as a weapon to continue a military war against Israel, lets down not only us in Israel, and we have an army to protect. It lets down only the Palestinians as well. It lets down the whole world. It lets down the concept of an international rules-based order. Because if the rule is twisted into whatever makes sense to continue a war of propaganda and misinformation against Israel, then it is not a rule. And it is not justice. And that is not a world in which the values that we are committed to of international cooperation can truly exist. And that is why it is so important that Israel win this war. And why it needs its friends to speak loudly and clearly in favor of Israel's right to win this war. Not to call it to a draw, but to win. To win a war we did not want we did not start, we did not expect, a war we wished we could wave a magic wand and make it go away. Because every day we are losing soldiers who are either 18, 19 year old kids fresh out of high school or reservists. People who on October 6th were planning their next vacation, planning a wedding, planning their next startup and have found themselves now for eight months ordinary people sitting in a tank defending their country, putting on uniform, because that is what their country needs in order for the country to survive. We wish we could make this go away. But we know that if this war ends with Hamas still holding on to hostages, if this war ends with Hamas still in power in Gaza, there will be a next time, and it will be worse. And it will be worse because Hamas will think the lesson it will draw is that it won or called it a draw because the free world stepped in to save it. Because after seeing acts of gang rape and families burned alive to an ash, and babies, for God's sake, taken hostage. There is still a baby hostage in Gaza. The free world fell for a campaign of propaganda and misinformation spread by the likes of Iran and China and Russia and decided to leave a terrorist entity on the doorstep of the only democracy in the Middle East.
Many of your neighbors here in Europe fall into the same trap time and time again of thinking that they are doing good when they are doing things that make them feel good, but cause a huge amount of damage. The decision by the governments of Spain, Ireland and Norway to recognize a non-existent Palestinian state in response to October 7th rewards Hamas for the barbaric violence of October 7th. And it incentivizes Hamas to do the same again, and it tells terrorists around the world, rape harder. Ireland, the government of Ireland, told Hamas that abducting Jewish babies is a good way to advance their national cause. The government of Norway told Hamas that raping Jewish women is a good way to advance its national cause. The government of Spain told Hamas that burning Jewish families alive is a good way to advance its national cause. And if we want to move beyond this conflict with the hostages home and Hamas toppled from power, we need the Palestinians to learn that terrorism is a dead end. There is no light at the end of that tunnel. It does not pay. Because if this war ends with Hamas and Iran and their supporters, believing that the free world fell for a vicious campaign of misinformation that emptied truth of meaning, that twisted law beyond recognition, that gave it rewards for conducting in the most savage terrorism this world has ever seen, then there will be a next time, it will be worse, and it will be the responsibility of those who stepped in to save Hamas, instead of standing by Israel's side as it fought the fight of the whole free world. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. And let's all hope for better days. Thank you.